the early 1950s and 60s, I grew up as a young student of architecture and developed my own understanding of architectural space. After reading Sigfrid Gradient's swiping essay, Space, Time and Architecture, which attempted to present a coherent and universal spatial theory for the modern movement in architecture. For a very long time, until the beginning of the 20th century, in fact, architectural knowledge and its history was built around the architectural objects, the built mass, the building, the corporeal qualities, and its iconography. For example, the study of Indian architecture was limited to the symbolism and meanings of various elements and icons of temple architecture. Same can be said about Greek architecture or the dimensional relationships and ratios of parts of the body of a build, building during Renaissance. Space was not even a part of our lexicon or vocabulary except in academia. However, in 1941, Gideon introduced us to the concept of space as an important element of architecture and a thoroughly convincing argument to explain the almost revolutionary architecture that was happening all around us in the Western world. It brought architecture at par with the developments in science, philosophy, and other plastic arts. His time span, the period that he was studying in that book, was the last 200 years, from the middle of the 18th century to the almost the middle of the 20th century. But these were also the 200 years during which the ideological foundation of modern architecture was laid. However, his reference was much deeper and wider. And this became clear a few years later when Gideon followed this up with another well-researched book, but this time on ancient in Egyptian architecture. And he claimed that to be the birthplace, the cradle of all architecture. More than two millenniums separated the two focuses of this inquiry. The first one was limited to the last 200 years. And then the second one about 2000 years ago. And though this demonstrated the vast intellectual breadth of the author, it was initially baffling. Still, there was a clear plan between the focuses of these two books, 2000 years. And the hint was given at the very beginning of the second book, when the author writes, the study of continuity helps to elucidate the problems of change, which contain the seeds of future developments. The position and the development of architecture are linked to these new dimensions, unquote. Let us deconstruct this. There are two major underlying assumptions here. One, that history and time is unidirectional. It moves from past to present to future in a single line. And two, that the seeds of what is happening today are contained in the past, that the past anticipates what might happen in future. This intention to look for continuity and the seeds of the future development makes it clear that Gideon was looking for the historical source, the fountainhead as it were, of the rational and relativistic architecture, space conception of the 20th century. In other words, he was re-looking at the past to uncover those elements and events which would strengthen and validate the ideas and development of the present. 
Now that's a dangerous thing to do because you're almost likely to be selective in picking up those elements and events of the past which would support your agenda. And what was that agenda? It was a far more profound and far reaching one. That of looking for a universal theory of space that would transcend all civilizational and cultural variations and nuances in the history of architecture. It would validate the emerging claim to universalize the rationalist and industrial language of architecture, which was rooted in European civilization and European experiences to make it universal as if it applies to the whole of humanity. I intend to show here where Gideon went wrong. Towards this end, Gideon proposed a three-stage progressive development of space conception. He located the first stage in Egypt and Greece, characterized by abstraction, the supremacy of the vertical, and the plane surface volumes in space. A few pages later, he makes an interesting statement that makes his position clear. And I quote, both the pyramids of Giza and the Acropolis at Athens express a similar relation to inner and outer space. Neither the Greeks nor the Egyptians ever developed interior space. With the same intensity, they expanded on relating their architecture to the cosmos. What is implied here is that space as an enclosure to be inhabited by man was not yet comprehended by man. And his conception of space was limited to articulating and organizing the ex exterior space by positioning his architecture as an object, an objective presence and not as an inhib inhabited place. The sense of interiority of space was yet to emerge in this narrative of progressive historical development. The second stage of the development of space conception, according to Gideon, is attributed to Roman period. And this is what he writes. Interior space and with it the whole vaulting problem become the highest aim of architecture. In the space conception of the second stage, the notion of architectural space was almost identical with the notion of hollowed out interior space. From the late antiquity on, hollowed out space, circumscribed interior space was the finest achievement of the art of building." Unquote. Gideon proposed that the key elements of both this first and the second stage of space conception are contained in the third stage, which not being preoccupied exclusively with either the exterior space that was in the first stage or interior, stage, interior space in the second stage, aim to coll collapse this rigid polarity into a single expression in which this clear distinction between the exterior and, and the interior was replaced by a space that was at once neither and yet both. Space was no more an objective thing with boundaries as in the object but a progressive concentration of energy brought about by the planar surfaces. Miss Van der Rohe's hypothetical project of brick country house built in 1923, which was followed by a German pavilion at Barcelona in 29, and Frank Lloyd Wright's Robbie house built in 1909 are the classic examples of this. None of these buildings are organized with what we today call rooms, spaces defined by walls and doors and windows. 
Each place here is an interior with respect to the one you are coming from and is an exterior to the one you are going to. This theory of Gideon is a neat formulation and has the power of simplicity and the Hegelian logic and inevitability. No wonder it quickly gained currency and became the received wisdom during the first half of the 20th century. However, upon closer examination, one finds it problematic on several counts. One, while the author claims at several places in this book, the universal applicability of this theory of space, that it applies to the whole of humanity, it, it is founded exclusively on the experiences of the Western civilization only. Also, a universal theory implies that there is a singular theory that can incorporate and explain space conceptions of all the civilizations of the world. Such a position has no room for plurality of conceptions in response to different experiences of different civilization and culture. People around the world have different experiences. If theory is a sublimation of experience, we do distill our experiences, generalize it and formulate theoretical knowledge. By doing so, a theory claiming to be universal must take into consideration experiences of other high civilizations such as Indian and Persian, which have over the centuries produce a rich architecture that, that can equal that of Egypt and Greece, but has also developed conception of space that will not fit into this neat formulation of Gideon. For example, that a, space, that, that a sense of space or a sense of interiority existed in India is borne out by the earliest rock temples dating back to the fourth century, contemporary to when Egypt was building pyramids. True, it is not articulated and written about in theoretical terms as much as the Western heritage. But by the mid 20th century, when Gideon's book came out, when he was writing this book, several studies were available, which show that different civilizations may have developed their own conception of space. And it would be more fruitful to talk about a plurality of space conceptions than a singular and universal one. In any case, architecture is too complex to be straight jacketed into a single theory. Second, the dialectical progression of three stages from the ancient beginning to the present and continuing to move towards a supposed unification itself is a product of the 17th century intellectual development in Europe, which ushered in rationalism and the linear progression of history. The wind of modernity that blew through Europe with a gale force left no intellectual activities untouched and architecture was no exception. This can be seen in the marked difference in all theoretical writings and architecture from those preceding this period, starting with Ladoli, Porold, and Logier in the 18th century, and Julian Guade and August Schwazi in the 19th century, and finally in the 20th century, J.M. Richards and Hitchcock and Johnson, all studies as we have already seen, have been aimed at interpreting historical architecture of the past in order to build a rational theory, which informed much of the modern movement. Gideon too belongs to this group of historians who seek to interpret, and I repeat interpret, 
the past through the lenses of the ideas, values, and experience of the, uh, experiences of the present. This is dangerous proposition as interpretation is an ideologically motivated enterprise prone to selectively foregrounding only those events and enterprises of the past that will support the present, relegating those other ones as insignificant. Such selective foregrounding is already visible in the way Gideon has built his argument. His historical sources are two European scholars and are art historians, Alvar Regal of Austria and August Marshall of Germany. Regal, who traced formation of space from pyramids to the early Christian period, coined the term Kunstwallen in German to describe the characteristics and boundaries of an epoch's aesthetics, as well as the intrinsic creative drive peculiar to every period. He proposed that each epoch of human development strives for a unique and non-repeatable form of design, which cannot be compared to that of any other period. This reinforces Gideon's sense of history as the unidirectional movement of time, where time past cannot be retrieved, cannot be repeated again. He also propounded on the notion of a fixed relationship between the observer and the space as in the perspective representation. Gideon himself notes that in Regal's scheme, the ideal observer is nailed to a fixed viewpoint, both for interior and exterior space. Schmarsau helped establish space as an absolute entity, independent of human existence and formation of space, round building, he called it, as a fundamental determinant of architecture as art. This is the space we represent through the tool of perspective. As is in the case of this famous painting, School of Athens by Raphael. It gives the vanishing point within and behind the picture plane. But by doing so, the observer is kept outside. You are outside of the space. No matter where you are, in the museum, the painting is hanging on the wall. And if you move, no matter which way you move, your relationship with the space remains constant because the space is outside of you. But these were not the only scholars expounding on the idea of space. There were others with views contrary to the above mentioned. For example, Edmund Husserl and his close associate and disciple Martin Heidegger had already questioned Regal and Marshall and the positivist orientation of science's philosophy of their day, proposing that experience and not reason, experience is the source of all knowledge. And examples which substantiate that space conception whereby the human body is an integral part of the space, bodily experiencing the space existed not only in Egypt, but also in Europe and other mature civilizations such as India, as we shall see soon. However, it is clear that the intellectual compass which Gideon accepted did not point him towards these alternative narratives. The magnetic pull of rationalism was indeed overwhelming. This has led Gideon not only to ignore other civilizations, but even some aspects of the ancient e Egyptian architecture too have been overlooked. Let us look at some of these examples. One of the more interesting images of the pyramids at Giza 
in the Lapsia series of 1842 is an imaginary aerial view, which Karl Lepsius, a German Egyptologist, drew by imagining himself hovering in the air. He did not have balloons or planes to fly. Gideon has used this image to substantiate his thesis. What is interesting about this image is that it demonstrates, as Gideon rightly observes, the essential unity between the pyramids, sky, and the limitless desert, the funerary purpose of the pyramids, and the evolution of the geometric form from step pyramids to bent pyramids have been studied in considerable details. The symbolic meanings as the seat of the God King in his afterlife has also been explored. Their visual power with pure geometrical triangular surfaces, highly polished originally, has been a source of considerable poetic imagination. But their role in the development of space conception has not been properly elaborated. In order to understand this, we have to imagine for a moment the desert as shown in that drawing without the pyramid. The ancient Egyptian man must have faced this vast and limitless space devoid of anything to help him locate or orient himself. The moment we put back the pyramid in the drawing, we realize that in addition to its funerary and symbolic functions, the pyramid was the most appropriate an effective means for the man to come to terms with the space of the desert with an imaginary vertical line originating from the center of the square base and passing through the apex to meet the sky, man has unmistakably altered the otherwise inhospitable and hostile space by identifying one singular place that he can call his own. At that moment, the structure transcended its original funerary purpose and became the embodiment of the collective sense of the cosmic reality. And what was that reality? It was a reality as experienced by men with their feet planted firmly on the ground and not as represented in the Lepsis's aerial view. The aerial view sees the pyramid with the mind's eye. The early Egyptians experienced it with the retinal eye. This captures our basic or fundamental topological and intuitive views regarding space in which space, objects in this case the pyramid, and the observer, that is the early Egyptians or you and me today, as another bodily object are all integral part of the same multidimensional matrix. But this space conception is not limited to the antiquity. Examples of such space conceptions are found until just before the Renaissance. Look at this map of Rome by Fra Paulino di Minorite, drawn in the 14th century. Today, we are used to seeing the map of Rome as if we are up in the air, seeing with our mind's eye, the whole of Rome all at once. Even though this ancient map does include almost all the primary landmarks of the city, the river Tiber, her hills and buildings, streets and the wall of fortification. These are not a reference to a single point that can orient an observer. But take a closer look at this map and we realize that what has been represented is what Rome felt like as the cartographer, bodily moved around on his feet from place to place. 
he drew hills and buildings as elevations as he faced them had and had to turn around to face other hills and buildings the cartographer always remi- remained earthbound and be bodily engaged as and a part of the space he is observing he had to bodily move around and at, at any given time can take in only a partial image of the world around him the idea of representing the world by imagining oneself bodily separated and hovering in the air is not yet developed what this map represents is the image of an experienced phenomena and not an imagined and abstract idea of the world which is the euclidean metrical or distant view of space that image eventually was to emerge only in the 17th century gideon's other claim that the conception of interior space was not developed by the egyptian and that it can be attributed to the roman period is also contestable for we do see some powerful interior spaces even in the early pharaohic architecture like at the temples of hathor and dendera and at luxor what this spaces share with that of the hypostyle hall at karnak is the density of columns and the hieroglyphics again we will have to transport ourselves back in time to the 19th dynasty in order to look for a probable occupational purpose of the spaces in order to better understand the nature of the space two characteristics of these spaces are unquestionable unlike the central aisle which is lit by the clear story opening the columned halls are dark spaces with an occasional small circular opening in the roof slab throwing a beam of light straight down and whatever little light reflected off other surfaces and also the massive columns are not merely dead mass supporting the roof they have active surfaces covered almost fully by hieroglyphics and meant to be approached closely for reading this can be done only by each person carrying his own source of light an oil lamp or a torch in his hand the extent of the glow of light falling on various columns will constitute the extent of its spatial enclosure the enclosure is actually enclosed by the darkness beyond the end of the glow of light this is like being in a dark cave Egyptians had created caves in the middle of the desert think about that Egyptians had created caves in the middle of the desert an unmistakable evidence of an intuitive sense of interiority there is an interesting parallel of, parallel of such space conception found in the buddhist cave architecture at ajanta in central india contemporary to the temple of karnak in egypt here the walls of the caves are decorated with paintings which narrate the stories from buddha's life as the devotee or several devotees move about reading the painted narrative at ajanta or sacred script at karnak each will carry her own special enclosure made by the torch with her with herself being in the center each one is inseparably woven in the mesh of this personal multidimensional space and there are as many spaces as there are as there are devotees 
the entire space is thus in dynamic motion and is available to each person only in fragments, never as a whole and at once. Each one ends up constructing a picture of reality, which is unique to him. There is no distance from where you can look in and contemplate the whole. The sense of wholeness comes by being one with the reality. This is the conceptual antithesis of the space which Gideon speaks about. The noted art historian, Stella Kramrich has this to say about the relationship between space and the observer participant at Ajanta Caves, which by the way also applies to the temple of Karnak. Indian painting of the Ajanta Cave known to us from the second to the sixth century AD is not conceived in terms of depth. It comes forward. It is not visualized as starting from the plane near to the spectator, that is the picture plane, and leading away from him. It does not lead away, but it comes forth. With the Ajanta painter, we look, however, into the opposite direction. Aware of ourselves as experiencing the world, we turn back upon ourselves as the place which holds the world and there we behold it in a direction that does not lead away from us, but points back towards ourselves. We are the stage and spectator of the world. We are the stage and spectator of the world as we see and live it. There is nothing to lead us away into the distance outside ourselves, and there is no room for nostalgia or perspective. There are no places to be gone. There are no places for us to gone to, for they're all within us, seen, visualized, and remembered. Memory transmits time with a rhythm of simultaneous sequences on the stage which we ourselves make up and behold." Unquote. We must also question Gideon's historiography. By selectively interpreting the past to validate the present, this historiography has constructed a one-dimensional conception of space. By seeing history as a singular linear trajectory, Gideon claims that the 20th century relativist space conception is the inevitable historical development from the object in space of Egypt and Greece to the vaulted interior of Rome. And that what Gideon claims is universally true, it applies to the whole of humanity. But in the Indian civilization, the trajectory has been in the opposite direction. From the interiority of the cave architecture in the beginning, to tentative experimentation of built mass on the ground, leading to magnificent edifices, both religious and secular, and the mythical space, which we will explore in the next session. The central issue then is the assumed universality of a particular space conception. There is no universal space conception. In addition to the Indian civilization, Persian and Arabic civilization have also developed space conception that are founded on their own experiences and are different at the very fundamental and philosophical level. They also predate the more recent and universalizing concept of space, which we now have accepted as a global standard. The core difference is the relationship between the subject, that is ourselves, the observer, participant, and the object, that is the space, as we saw in that painting by Raphael. The Euclidean space, this Euclidean space, 
that is the basis of Gideon's thesis, is conceived as an objective entity independent from the observer and to be contemplated through the cerebral faculty of reason. The observer in such an empirical Euclidean space is not a participant in the making of the space. He is an outsider and the objective reality is outside of him. The alternative space conception on the other hand overcomes this dichotomy. The observer is very much a part of the space. This space is made only on that condition in fact. When the observer becomes one with the space, it no longer remains for him the symbol of the cosmos, it is the cosmos. Each observer is on his own journey. Therefore, there are as many spaces as there are observers. Remember the map of Rome we saw earlier? I want to end this by demonstrating the above by the example of space of Fatipur Sikri built in 1568. Jacqueline Terwitt, the British town planner, journalist and editor and educator who visited Fatipur Sikri has an excellent observation about the spatial quality of this urban complex. Wherever the eye turns, the view is held, but every step it changes. Nowhere is there a fixed center. Nowhere a point from which the observer can dominate the whole. Equally nowhere does he stand conspicuously removed from the center, a spectator in the wings. From the moment he steps within this urban core, Mahale Khas, he becomes an intimate part of the scene, which does not impose itself upon him, but disclosing itself gradually to him at his own pace and according to his own pleasure. While it is clear at first glance that this is an ordered composition, one looks in vain for the key to it in terms of the Western academic art. It is very difficult for us to get away from the rule of the accepted vision of our Western culture and to realize even intellectually that this is not the only way of looking at things. Interestingly, Jacqueline Terwitt, the author of this above quote, was one of the scholars who helped Gideon prepare the later editions of his book. Gideon also acknowledges her. It is not unlikely that she may have drawn Gideon's attention to the alternative space conceptions that she knew about. But by selectively interpreting the past to validate the present, modern historiography has constructed a one-dimensional space conception. The notion of geometric space existing independent of human consciousness and experience is one of the pillars of this edifice. The other being the Hegelian view of history, which seeks to arrange events in a linear and logical sequence. But this, this space conception so constructed is devoid of depth because its inability to incorporate plurality of worldviews in defining its self-identity. Gideon's choice of the lapsus image of the pyramid, I believe is not accidental. It must be deliberate. By looking at the pyramid and its space as a phenomenon outside and independent of the human consciousness and experiences is the only way he could have constructed a logical argument showing the supposed inevitability of Eurocentric architecture and the relativist notions of space, which marks the modern movement in architecture, especially the international style 
Gideon was looking for a way to show that such architecture, though founded exclusively on the European experiences, is universal and historically inevitable. The rest of the humanity will, as this argument goes, sooner or later catch up with this. Thank you.